Good evening. Uh, hi, everyone. First off, uh, thank you very much for coming here. Uh, my name is Alessio Dantino. I'm the founder and CEO of Forward Footing. And I can't be more thrilled to welcome you uh, today at the official unveiling of uh, our Barcelona first uh, food and food tech innovation hub. Um, we have been working quite tirelessly uh, for putting this event together, so we really hope that you're going to enjoy it. Uh, we have a very um, sort of busy agenda today, um, so I'll, uh, I'm going to squeak through the, today's menu. We're going to be talking about food, uh, and uh, we couldn't basically do it, uh, or, or basically, we're going to be talking about food tech, to be precise, but uh, I couldn't basically help myself to put a menu together. and. Uh, we're going to basically uh, start with uh, introducing you to uh, Gonzalo from Tally Garden, um, Mireya and Clara from Forward Footing, which are my partners in crime in, uh, in making this uh, endeavor uh, happen. And uh, we're going to be then uh, moving on to um, Carlotta from uh, Good Food Institute, who's going to give us a keynote about the state of the heart of uh, the alternative plant, the protein uh, space in Europe. Uh, we're going to move on then to uh, speaking with some international, actually, uh, ecosystem builders, uh, Johan from Sweden FinTech and uh, Miranda from uh, Food Valley, who are actually going to be connecting from Zoom, so hopefully on the tech side of it uh, will actually work. And uh, then we're going to have Edward uh, from Disvitar, who is going to help us uh, to understand how they use actually technology in the kitchen. Uh, and ultimately, I'll be closing uh, the, the, the day with uh, a, a brief, actually, keynote about the Mediterranean food tech ecosystem. Uh, but this would not end here, as there will be a lot of content. But then, you know, as you, as I know, most of you came here for also for the food. So <laughs> I'm kidding, but it's, uh, I'm sure that this will spark an ap appetite. So at the end of it, we're going to uh, move on the first floor. Uh, where we're going to be uh, enjoying food from uh, 15 startups that we have selected. Uh, some of them are resident members of our hub, some others uh, we have selected them because we think they're doing some cool stuff. And uh, we have divided them into two batches, food and tech and uh, drinks. So you're going to be uh, basically seeing them, uh, they have no lab boots, and you can engage with them, they will let you try their products if they have some, or they will, they're going to showcase their technology. And this will happen on the first floor, so we'll, we'll basically uh, take you there. Before I pass it on to Gonzalo, uh, let me just give you some uh, uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, as you know, I'm not wearing my mask right now, because I'm basically two meters away from uh, the first row, but we need to keep our mask on throughout the, the event. And uh, you, have, you have received a little uh, pamphlet uh, that actually gives you all the, the measures that we need to follow. Um, and on the other side, you have the, the full agenda of what is going to be happening today. Again, thanks a lot for coming in, and I'll give it over to Gonzalo to tell you a little bit more about Telegarden, which is also our partner in crime to set it up, uh, uh, the food tech out here. Thank you for us our partner in crime. Porque al final nosotros, soy el director de Talent Garden en España. Eh, Talent Garden es, queremos ser más que un coworking y no solamente decirlo, sino hacerlo. Y justamente una iniciativa como esta, como Forward Fooding, es algo que nos hace hacer lo que decimos. ¿vale? De hecho, estaba antes mirando los primeros mails que tuvimos, Alessio y yo, cuando empezamos a hablar de cómo, cuándo lanzar el, el, el Innovation Hub de Food Tech. El email de Alessio era de febrero de 2020. O sea, en febrero de 2020 empezamos a hablar. Recibo un email, David del CEO de Talent Garden me manda un email, te presento a Alessio. Y me, me cuenta que quiere montar un hub de, de food tech en Barcelona. Digo, bo, vamos a hablar de esto. Febrero de 2020, marzo, es historia. Imaginando que fue marzo y en adelante, toda la pandemia, hablando con Alessio sobre el hub de food tech. Es un reto muy grande. Pasamos toda la pandemia con una incertidumbre, no sabíamos qué iba a pasar, no sabíamos nada de nada. Y sí que tengo que recalcar que ayer se tenían las ideas muy claras y sabía exactamente lo que quería montar, sabía cuál era la visión, la misión. Y estuve empujando el proyecto y, y claro, yo en ese momento tengo que ser honesto, no conocía mucho de Foodtech. 
y empecé a involucrarme en qué significaba esto, qué, qué consistía esto de food tech y me fue enganchando un poquito y hasta que ahora, bueno, pues es una cosa, es un tema que me interesa no solo porque está aquí el hub de food tech, sino porque estoy entendiendo más. Yo creo que ahora mismo en la sociedad hay una necesidad de entender qué está pasando muy fuerte. Como yo, hay muchísima gente de fuera que le pasa lo mismo. Entonces, un, y no una necesidad como esta, ya no solamente, claro, tú no puedes saber de algo si alguien no te ha explicado antes, con lo cual creo que esta, esta iniciativa que, se, que sucede aquí en Talent Garden, y que os damos las gracias de hecho, eh, nos, nos hace ser lo que decimos, más que un coworking, más que un espacio de innovación y, y queremos apoyarlo hasta el fondo. Durante este camino, que hoy, un año y medio después de aquel primer email, de, de, que, de aquella idea que hoy es una realidad, estamos aquí para, para hacer el uncoding de, de lo que es este Innovation Hub. Y en este camino, pues, se han ido añadiendo personas, tengo que decir que Alessio tiene muy buen ojo, eh, que son las cofundadoras de Fugal Food, son, son Clara y Mirella Y desde la parte que me toca, tengo que decir que es un equipazo y que esto es pues, un proyecto que, que ya no solo lo que está haciendo hasta ahora, lo que habéis hecho hasta ahora, sino que va a llegar a hacer a futuro, eh, promete muchísimo. Yo creo que nos hace falta a nosotros, gente como yo, que estamos aprendiendo sobre lo que es esto, sino a toda esta sociedad que está aprendiendo lo que es Foodtech, eh, que es un proyecto que, que puede tener un impacto muy, muy fuerte a la, en, en la sociedad, ¿no? en el mundo. Entonces, bueno, quiero dar la bienvenida a Clara y a Mireia, los, las Partners in Crime de, de Alessio de Talent Garden, y, y bueno, un súper equipazo para llevar este proyecto adelante. Así que un aplauso muy fuerte, por favor. Bueno, llegó el día. Muchísimas gracias a todos los que estáis aquí, los, los uh, food enthusiasts que os habéis desprendido de vuestro día a día, que sabemos que ha sido difícil para poder venir aquí y estar con nosotros este día tan importante. Gracias también a las personas que no han podido venir porque eh, hemos tenido que limitar el aforo por uh, problemas de, de seguridad COVID y mucha gente se ha quedado fuera, pero prometemos que si la pandemia remite vamos a poder organizar muchos eventos como este en el futuro. Y eso sería una muy buena noticia también para la humanidad. Damos las gracias también a los speakers, thank you very much, the ones who coming from abroad, para estar aquí porque realmente pues, formáis parte de una pieza importante para nosotros. Esperamos que os inspiren a todos, que os provoquen reflexión y que os provoquen también acción sobre, a partir de la información que os vamos a pasar hoy. Y quería dar las gracias también a las startups que nos esperan en la primera planta, nos están viendo por streaming, porque nos han preparado un showcase fantástico que esperamos podáis disfrutar muchísimo. Bien, solo deciros que nosotros iniciamos esta aventura con muchísima ilusión y con muchísima convicción. Ilusión porque es muy motivante rodearse de la energía de mentes inquietas, creativas y comprometidas. Y los que os relacionáis con startups sabéis que esto es eh, el patrón de un emprendedor de los cuales nosotros tenemos la suerte de poder rodearnos todos los días. Y con mucha convicción porque es verdad que los retos que tiene por delante la industria alimentaria son gigantes, pero sabemos, y lo hemos demostrado ya con el Hub de Londres, que con innovación y colaboración va a ser posible saltar y resolver estos desafíos. Y por eso estamos aquí, por eso estamos tan motivados, por eso estamos tan convencidos. Y solo hace falta ver pues, los que habéis venido hoy aquí, que sois un ecosistema fantástico de Barcelona y alrededores. Tenemos un país donde el food tech tiene muchísimo potencial, por eso hemos creado el, el hub aquí. Aproximadamente un tercio de los que, las caras que estoy viendo sois um, compañías grandes de alimentación, corporativos. Otro tercio aproximadamente, que son los que están arriba, son las startups, otra pieza muy fundamental. Y otro tercio, pues sois un conglomerado muy interesante y muy relevante de actores del sistema que nos van a ayudar. Tenemos aquí instituciones, tenemos inversores, tenemos cocineros, tenemos empresas que son startups friendly, y con todo este conglomerado de, de, de personas, de equipos, de talento que tiene la ciudad, estamos convencidos de que esto va a ser posible. Ya para, para acabar, solo deciros que afrontamos este reto eh, con muchísima ambición, pero también con muchísima humildad. 
nosotros al final somos el pegamento, solo somos una pieza. Nosotros somos el imán, el pegamento, los conectores de este ecosistema. Pero las piezas sois vosotros. Entonces, estamos convencidos de que si cada uno pone su parte, eh, vamos a poder convertir ¿no? el food tech de Barcelona, de este país, como una referencia uh, europea importante. De ahí el título que hemos dado la ponencia o el subtítulo de Barcelona al mundo que estamos convencidos que vamos a poder conseguir. Sin más, os dejo con Mireia que os explicará un poco más quiénes somos Forward Fooding. Muy bien. Pues a mí me toca invitaros a un viaje, a un viaje muy cortito, en el que a través de la música queremos transmitiros cuáles son nuestros valores, lo que nos mueve, lo que nos impulsa, lo que hace que disfrutemos de nuestro trabajo cada día y de la construcción de este gran proyecto que como nos han explicado Clara y Alessio, esperamos que vosotros también forméis parte de él. Así que os invito a relajaros y a dejaros llevar. Muchas gracias. Muchísimas gracias. Um, I wish I actually <laughs> going to switch from English to Spanish all the time. I forgot to mention that the event is, will be in Spanglish, as you probably have realized. <laughs> there will be speakers uh, speaking in English. There will be speakers speaking in Spanish, and I'll do I'll stick with English, right? Because my Spanish is not quite there yet. So, without further ado, we thought it actually explaining what we do through a video and uh, and actually introducing our sonic brand so through audio will be the best way to actually explain what we do in in a different i guess way Hello, hello, and welcome to the Uncoding Food Tech event, redesigning the future of food. From Barcelona to the world. We're really excited to have you here. Today, Forward Fooding is presenting its new Sonic brand. That's right, Sonic brand. It's the sound equivalent of our yellow, orange, and black logo. Sound adds a new dimension to our brand identity. At Forward Fooding, Innovation is one of our core values. But how does innovation sound? Let's take a listen. By the way, that's a hang drum, one of the most innovative musical instruments. Some of you already know us, and you know how we believe in a positive attitude. This is how we express it. avoid it. This melody is in the key of F major. Major scales represent happiness and positivity. Our heart beats at 60 to 110 beats per minute. Our enthusiasm drives us at 130 beats per minute. Do you feel it? Of course, we're technologically driven. So how about an electronic bass drum? Thanks to this ecosystem, listen to how new instruments interact with one another the same way we do with you. Well, well, that's uh, that's how we thought that uh, it was a good way to condense what we do in a in a sort of a video. Uh, can't thank enough for some branding the team for uh, if you can hear me. 
You can hear me anyway, right? Do you need a good mic? <laughs> Maybe I change the mic? Any better now? Yes, fantastic. So, we thought that this would be, would be a, a, I guess, fun way as well to, to let you know what we do in a, through a video. Again, I, th I cannot thank enough uh, Sun Branding Boutique guys to, to let us uh, actually have this, uh, as is, it was, yes, part of our uh, thinking and what we do and our DNA, but they basically put it into a sound, which uh, I think is rather uh, interesting. But again, we have a very uh, busy agenda, so without further ado, uh, let me introduce you to the first uh, keynote speaker uh, of tonight. Uh, Carlot Lucas actually comes from uh, Amsterdam originally and from Lisbon, uh, technically, uh, although she is American. And uh, she is the first one who actually accepted our invite uh, to travel all the way to Barcelona to give this keynote uh, to you guys. So, Again, thank you very much for, for doing that. I know that these, these days is not that easy traveling. So, And uh, she's basically the Corporate Engagement uh, uh, Manager and the Good Food Institute for Europe. And she will be talking uh, about what's hot, basically, in, uh, in food tech in Europe. Uh, so without further ado, let me welcome uh, Carlotte Lucas to the stage uh, to tell me more about what they do. A lot, Alessio, and yeah, thanks for this amazing event, getting the opportunity to speak with all of you. Really exciting, my first in-person event in a year and a half, so great to be here. And I'm going to take the next 20 minutes or so to share a little bit about what's happening in the alternative protein industry, some of the amazing innovation we're seeing, and the role that both startups and corporates are playing. So. Let's start with a bit of a foundational question that really underlies everything we're talking about is how are we going to feed 10 billion people in 2050 in a sustainable, efficient, and safe manner? Because today we're almost at already 8 billion people and our food system's already in trouble. We are looking at a couple issues. From a sustainability perspective, if we're talking about industrial animal agriculture, it's one of the top uh, contributors to environmental issues, including water pollution or air pollution, uh, water usage, and loss of biodiversity. And it's also one of the biggest drivers of greenhouse gas emissions at almost 15%, which is more than all the trains, planes, cars in the world combined. So there's a sustainability angle. There's also an efficiency angle. Chicken, which is one of the most um, efficient animals out there, it takes about eight calories of feed going in to get one calorie of meat going out. And that results in almost 80% of land being used to either raise or feed animals. Um, and it only provides about one third of the protein supply. And then the third element, safety, it's not talked a lot about, but should actually be really <laughs> top of mind for us because it's, it's highly concerning. Um, animals are use most of the medicine that we create today, most of the antibiotics, and this is resulting in antimicrobial resistance. And experts expect that by 2050, most of the medicines won't be effective on humans anymore, and that will lead to millions and millions of deaths every year. So there are some challenges, um, but luckily there's also some solutions, and, and it's partly right here in this room. Food tech, the emerging sector, rethinking about how we design, produce, deliver, and enjoy food. It's a, it's a pretty broad sector. It, it covers everything from ad tech to kitchen tech to waste, uh, waste production or management. But today, indeed, I'm going to be talking about next-gen food and drinks, and specifically alternative proteins. Because at the Good Food Institute, this is a picture we think about every single day. It demonstrates our annual meat production. Today, we produce about 350 million metric tons of meat per year. And to put that in context a little bit, because I know that's a number that can be hard to wrap your head around, that is about the equivalent of one million Volkswagen Beetles of meat being produced daily. And we have a growing population, which is starting to consume more meat. So by 2050, the expectation is that about 500 million metric tons of meat will be needed every year. So this is top of mind for us. And maybe just take a step back. If you haven't heard of the Good Food Institute before, we are a nonprofit organization funded by philanthropy that's 
thinking about how to create a sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. And, and we do that in a couple of different ways. Um, we think around uh, the science and technology element, how we can advance open access research and really create a thriving community of researchers and academics to, to advance this industry. We engage with companies across the supply chain to create additional investment, to drive innovation, and to scale the supply chain all faster than market forces could alone. And finally, we work on the policy side to ensure that there's a fair and level playing field for new alternative protein products, and that there's also a public R&D funding going into the space. And we do this on a, a global level. We are about 100 people spread around the world, uh, the United States, Brazil, India, Israel, APAC, and right here in Europe. And so, probably no surprise by now to you, our solution is around accelerating alternative proteins. Because we have told people for decades, or at least scientists, environmentalists, uh, nutritionists have, have told people to cut down their meat consumption, but with little to no success. So we believe we need to we need to change the message, we need to change the approach, we need to create products that are delicious, that are affordable, and that are accessible. And we can do that um, via plants, etc. And basically, it comes down to making something people want to eat. So when we talk about alternative proteins, we talk about three different production platforms. The first one being plant-based. That's probably the one most of us in this room are familiar with, recreating conventional animal products from plant ingredients, soy, wheat, etc. Fermentation is a, a rising pillar in the field that, that's really exciting. It's the use of microorganisms like bacteria and yeast to either create proteins or other functional ingredients like fats that can be used in alternative protein products. And then there's cultivated meat and seafood, where on a cellular level, we're really able to completely replicate um, an animal product by, by taking just a, a few cells from an animal, putting it in something we call a bioreactor, and feeding it the nutrients it would normally get in an animal till it grows to the piece of meat we're, we're used to eating. So there's a lot of amazing things happening in the space. And, that's also why we're a far cry from the, the veggie burger of, of the 80s that only the vegetarians and the, and the vegans were eating. And so we're also seeing that the, the market is, is changing. Um, companies in the alternative protein space aren't thinking about the vegetarians and vegans anymore. They're really focusing on the flexitarians, the, the people that are trying to reduce their meat consumption, and the omnivores. And from a business perspective, you can imagine that that makes a lot of sense. That market's a lot bigger than the, the 6% of vegetarians and vegans that exist. Um, and, and this is reflected in, in the data. About 89% of consumers who regularly eat plant-based foods do not consider themselves vegans or vegetarians. So changing consumer market, a larger consumer market. And that's also why recent data that was released this year of the first, yeah, first sales data of plant-based um, sales here in Europe demonstrate a massive growth. Over the past two years, retail sales for plant-based products have increased 49% to about 3.6 billion euros, which is amazing. And, and this is not just a trend here in Europe. This is this happening globally. And this is being driven primarily by plant-based meat and plant-based milk. And this is also why when we talk to uh, market research companies, consulting firms who are trying to look at, okay, how big is the market going to be? I mean, the numbers differ quite drastically, but we're, we're easily talking into the hundreds of billions over the next 10 to 20 years. Um, and whatever the, the real number is, nobody really knows. This is clearly a, a massive opportunity that, that people are starting to take advantage of. And it's also the reason why we're seeing a lot of venture capital flowing into this space. 2020 was a record year for alternative proteins with, with over 3 billion euros or dollars invested in the space which was more than three times what was invested in 2019, and more than half of what was invested over the past decade alone. Um, so investment in the space is massive. If we're looking at Europe specifically, numbers are a little bit smaller, but, but really promising. 2020, a bit, little over 400 million was invested, um, but about four times uh, what was invested in 2019. And you can see, especially in the, the fermentation and cultivated spaces, the kind of the new pillars, that the growth there is really impressive. 
And the reason why you know, consumers are so interested, why investors are interested, is because startups and companies are, are really starting to push the edge with innovation and develop really next level products. So I just want to share a couple of examples of startups that, that I think are doing some amazing things. And we later have a, a lot of startups and stairs that we can talk about as well. Um, but I want to start with the Chilean startup, plant-based startup, Notco, which uses machine learning or um, their AI algorithm to identify plant-based products that give the right taste um, to the products they're developing. So the, the plant-based milk they've put on the market contains, I believe, green peas, a little bit of pineapple, cabbage, chicory fiber, some cocoa, and, and a couple of other things. And so through their proprietary algorithm, they've been able to figure out what are the right elements of each of those plant-based products to, to really recreate that, that experience, which is pretty cool if you ask me. Then on the fermentation side, there's an American um, company called Perfect Day, which uses uh, precision fermentation or microorganisms to recreate milk proteins. So they're able to create casein and whey, um, the exact same biological composition that, that you would find in actual milk. And um, last year they were able to bring on the market the first precision fermentation products for consumers to enjoy. So that's something we are really looking at carefully and I think provides a lot of opportunity. And finally, I would be remiss not to talk about the, the Eat Just plant-based and cultivated meat company. They developed cultivated chicken nuggets last year that were approved by the Singapore Regulatory Agency and, and were sold for the first time to people in December of last year. And this was really a pivotal moment in the cultivated sector. Um, and so, yeah, really exciting to see. But there's not just innovation happening all around the world. There's innovation happening right here in Europe. Um, so I want to highlight a, a few examples. First one being a, a Slovenian startup called Juicy Marbles. And they're the first plant-based company that have been able to create filet mignon. Um, to date, most of the products we've seen to the, on the market are, are minced meat or beef or burgers. But so the, really the next level, the new frontier is, is whole cuts. And they have a proprietary production um, process where they've been able to yeah, recreate the, the structure of a filet mignon. Then there's the Finnish uh, fermentation company, Solar Foods, that as they put it, literally create protein out of air. They use carbon capture and electricity to ferment into protein. I have to be honest, I don't know the science behind it, but it sounds pretty impressive. And finally, Mosa Meat, the, the leader of the cultivated, or the starter at least of the cultivated meat sector in the Netherlands, the, the founder, Mark Post, who created the first cultivated meat burger in 2013, which at that time cost about a, a quarter of a million euros to make. They've been able to bring that price down exponentially. So amazing things happening right here in Europe. And that's why we're also seeing corporates getting much more involved in this space in a, in a multiple a variety of ways. First one being corporate investment. So the massive agri-food company Cargill has invested in both cultivated as well as plant-based companies and the cultivated meat companies Upside and Aleph Farms, as well as the pea protein producer Purus, which actually supplies Beyond Meat with their pea protein for their burger. Then Tyson, one of the biggest meat companies in the world, has also developed, uh, invested in both spaces in the Israeli cultivated meat company Future Feed, uh, Future Meat, and the plant-based seafood company Good Catch and Beyond Meat. But I think what's really exciting is it's not just food companies investing in this space right now. Even Merck, the pharmaceutical biotechnology company, is interested because many of their processes align to what we're seeing in the cultivated and fermentation sector. So they've invested both in the in Mosa Meat as well as the precision fermentation um, company Formo out of Germany. So we're seeing lots of investment coming in this space, but we're also seeing a lot of strategic partnerships. This is just the partnerships that have popped up over the past seven months. Um, but Beyond Meat has partnered with PepsiCo to bring plant-based snacks to the world. Clara Foods, which develops egg proteins through the uh, precision fermentation, has partnered with the beer brewer AB and Bev to leverage their fermentation capacity to scale their production. And finally, uh, Blue Nalu, one of the biggest cultivated seafood companies in the world, has partnered with Thai Union, one of the biggest seafood companies in the world, as well as the Japanese conglomerate Mitsubishi Corporation. 
So these strategic partnerships are starting to pop up and, and we're really seeing that help to scale and distribute these products globally. So before I wrap up, I want to share a couple things of, of what we think is ahead. As I already mentioned, whole cuts development is definitely top of mind. So thinking about how beyond uh, burgers and sausages, how you can recreate a steak, for example, that's, that's the next challenge and opportunity here in alternative proteins. We're also seeing seafood being top of mind. Maybe it's documentaries like Seaspiracy that show that it's not just the issues that we have on land, but we also have issues in the sea with how we catch our fish there um, that are making this yeah, area more interesting for consumers and for companies. But we also see um, an opportunity for hybrid products to play a, a much bigger role. And with that, I mean combining multiple of the production platforms I've talked about. So plant-based protein with cultivated fat um, and to really get the best of each of these platforms together. We're also seeing more startups and companies enter the B2B space. Um, especially in the, the cultivated field, for example, when cultivated startups just started popping up a couple of years ago, they had to do everything from scratch. Um, there was no one there to support them, and now as more players are coming into the field, there's an opportunity to really specialize more and focus on one element, which I think will be really important as we build out the, the value chain here. And finally, there's no doubt that we're gonna see additional corporate investment and strategic partnerships popping up as many of these startups are really starting to scale and, and trying to bring their products to consumers. So with that, I want to thank you uh, for your attention. If you are interested in learning more about alternative proteins, I would suggest you go to our website, gfi.org. We have a, a wealth of information there, including a number of annual state of the industry report that will tell you everything you need to know about what's happening in this space. Um, and I hope I was able to show that this industry, the alternative protein sector, it's growing, it's growing rapidly, in part because of the consumer demand, in part from because of the investment from, from different players. But at the end of the day, we're still very much at the beginning of this space and there's room for everyone to get involved in. We need everyone to get involved because the, the size of the problem is big. So we need all, uh, all the bright minds in this room. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlotta. Uh, well, I always find fascinating uh, the Good Food Institute's reports, uh, which I actually feed myself with <laughs> quite regularly. So thanks again, Carlotta, for coming in to share um, your wealth of knowledge uh, in this space. Sometimes I, even when I work, you know, in, in, every day, in, uh, in, even in the alternative protein space, I just don't realize how fast also this ecosystem is growing. So. Uh, I think, you know, we, we also collaborate very closely to puzzle all the pieces together to actually get the, the best or the most up-to-date, you know, view of what's going on in, the, in this ecosystem. Um, so, fantastic. Now, we're going to be trying to basically get these international speakers on Zoom to join us, uh, uh, basically, to, to talk about uh, uh, their ecosystems. I see that uh, there are some signs of uh, Zoom coming in. <laughs> Um, they have been, uh, well, I met actually Johan, who's going to be the first one uh, speaking uh, a couple of years ago, actually three years ago to be precise, in Stockholm. Um, he became a good friend. Again, uh, uh, they run basically an ecosystem, the Nordic one. We, used, we, we run the one in, uh, in London and one here now. So uh, technically, you know, we were kind of competing in a way, but we've always been collaborating after all to, to really hut up you know, on our ecosystems. And I think that has been really the, the common you know, threat. So what we wanted to bring you here is really the, the knowledge of what they have learned in a way uh, by building their ecosystems. Uh, I guess the mistakes also they've made. <laughs> we have made also a ton ourselves. Um, and uh, to basically help you understand what it takes also to build and orchestrate effectively an ecosystem. Um, I guess uh, we have uh, them joining. Yeah. So, well, Johan is going to be sharing basically his screen from Stockholm uh, to tell you uh, to tell a bit more about Sweden food tech. And uh, we have someone else from our team handling all this uh, to ensure that uh, 
they could join us uh, and share Basile Day's screen with us. We're gonna be just waiting, maybe. Hello there, I'm my own, by the way. Um, there we go. <laughs> yes, Yuan can hear us. I have unfortunately not been able to hear what you've been discussing so far. Uh, but if I'm on, you could please just give me a sign of some sort for the chat, perhaps. And then I can run a short presentation regarding what's happening up in the Nordics. Uh, he cannot, I guess, hear us, but someone from our team can actually let him know <laughs> that he's on. Well, we managed to get him here, which <laughs> with us, which is already quite a bit. Indeed. Okay, apparently I'm on. So um, sorry, I can't see you all, and uh, and I hope you can see me and hear me. Uh, let me do a short intro to the Nordics and ecosystem thinking. My name is Joanne Jorgensen, and I'm the founder of Sweden Food Tech. Let's share my screen and see what happens. Um, here we go. So, what uh, Sweden Food Tech does is actually accelerate the innovation for the future of food. And we do this as a company. Uh, we're not a governmental agency or anything like that. We're a pure commercial operator. Uh, we do a couple of things. We work a lot with innovation programs. This is one example, the Bloomer program that we ran together with the Swedish Co-op and uh, Norsken, which is a sustainability foundation where we, well, do the accelerator stuff uh, but we also run other types of innovation programs more targeted towards what is specifically needed with our partners. And uh, we always try to work these to reshape the food system for a more sustainable world. We have our mantra, which is good food, and that is food that's good for you, good for the planet, and also that tastes good. That's very important to all of us. Uh, as part of this, we also have a public outreach, and there we run something called the Sweden Food Tech Big Meet, which is one of the largest food tech conferences out there. It recently happened online only, and fortunately, we hope to be back again, because uh, when we will be back again, this is the summit part of something called the Smaka Good Food Festival, which happens to be one of the largest food festivals on the planet that we also run. Every long COVID year, we gather some 400,000 people to a park downtown Stockholm in order to celebrate the future of food. This is a little known fact, but hey, we do have something when it comes to food up in the north. We also uh, will host or curate rather the Swedish pavilion here under construction at the Expo in Dubai in uh, February next year. Uh, the Expo is, of course, as most of you guys know, uh, the Universal Expo, where all countries band together in order to, to address some, some critical issues and exhibit what they have uh, to exhibit uh, for a bunch of months, six months. Uh, this time it's in Dubai, and we will be there in the Swedish Pavilion, and we will curate the official food week. So then we will take over, and we will not just send food stuff from Sweden, this pavilion, in order to be exhibited. We will try and make this a place for the entire world to congregate and discuss the future issues around food and food tech. Now, uh, we will get into food and food tech in a little while, a bit deeper, uh, but I always, also would like to show you a couple of slides from the upcoming Stockholm Food Tech Ecosystem Report that we're currently doing together with the city of Stockholm. Uh, which has been one of the key facilitators of what we have been doing over the you know, past six years that we have been in existence, and, and all of us in one or another aspect uh, in the food system before that. My background, for instance, is tech. And we've done this before, and we, we're getting back to it again now. And our goal with this report is to map the food tech ecosystem and the various players in it, and then look into how we can create the an even better enabling environment for startups and scale-ups and corps and all the other players uh, that constitute a vibrant ecosystem. Uh, let me show you one of the pieces what we're doing in this is we're mapping out, of course, everyone who's involved in, um, uh, in food and food tech. This is again, uh, it's one of the drafts from the report, so expect more companies in the final one. Um, but you start seeing the picture here with lots of next-gen food rings and new products 
lots of consumer apps and services. And we'll get back to why that is. Um, and the previous picture, by the way, is only for the city of Stockholm. There's a lot going on in the Nordics in general terms. And we see also that investors are paying attention to food tech. And we mapped out also the venture capital investments in the Nordics, where Sweden leads the, you know, the pack before Finland. Denmark and Norway are actually lagging behind. Iceland, I think, are pretty active, uh, you know, because there are only 300,000 of them, uh, which is, of course, a ridiculously small country. But that, that is, I think, boxing over their weight class uh, when it comes to food and food tech. Uh, there's also a lot of other money flowing into the world of food and food tech in the Nordics. It's direct investments from corps. You have big funds lending money, uh, you know, other types of, you know, angels, super angels are making investments into this space. How come? Because this is a really strange place to talk about food. If you look at the Nordics, uh, they're always regarded as having the worst food in Europe. And, um, and of course, especially compared to places like Spain and Barcelona, uh, you know, Swedish food is considered or Nordic food is considered to be nothing uh, but fermented shark or herring and, and strange habits of eating crayfish. But, you know, food is more than just what's on the plate. It's an entire sector that is, that is pushing other sectors as well. So by diving into the funding by some industry here in the food tech report, we can see that ag tech, urban farming, next gen food, food and drinks are of course key here. Last minute delivery and retail tech, of course, also changing the nature of, of food and how it's being delivered to you. E-groceries as well. And I would stress the, the, the new types of services, however, that emerge in and around the food system. Uh, when a food is supposed to give you nourishment, someone is, needs to be there in order to help you, guide you to what is good for you and for the planet and all the other things that you want to achieve, whether it's productivity or lessening your waste or whatever. Uh, so data and food are tightly knit together, but we only see the food part of it so far. And now we try to untangle the data side of food and do things with it. And then suddenly the Nordics is an interesting food place. It is also interesting because it's traditionally a place where, uh, where we you know, group together. Uh, it has, of course, to do with, um, with this strange nature of living close to the North Pole. You have to work together because if you don't, you're probably gonna die. Uh, so that's always been the case. And it is, so to say, in the Nordic DNA, if you like, to, um, to participate in various types of group thinking and, and working together. This is also here a map of some of the players in the food system out there, some players in the food ecosystem, and, um, or food tech ecosystem, rather. And uh, there will be more logos on this map once we've done with this. But every single player on this map here is probably working with every other single player on this map. Very much a collaborative culture. And if you take a look at why why the, the, the culture side is so important, I mean, our culture eats strategy for breakfast. That's an old saying from management consultancy. And I think the four parts that we need to look at here, why Nordics are interesting, it is that successful founders stay and reinvest in the ecosystem. That means that the previous success of the tech sector, where a lot of good things came out of the Nordics, is actually now be, being deployed again, this time into you know the next venture. And many of those ventures tend to be focused around sustainability, health, and food. So we're actually benefiting right now from the already existing tech, eco, uh, tech ecosystem. Uh, it's a collaborative environment, and I said that before. It's English speaking. Uh, most places are English speaking these days, so we perhaps shouldn't talk too much about it. But there is a tendency to, to have English speaking everywhere now, even uh, amongst Swedish companies. And it isn't considered anymore a problem if you don't speak Swedish because you will just be taken into the group and everyone will adapt to that. So, so it is an international environment. 
And uh, playing to the advantage is, is of course, uh, it's a small market, which means that you need to push outside as soon as you can. The Nordics in total are roughly 30 million people. Um, GDP-wise, uh, stronger than that, of course, but it's still a relatively small market. Uh, it is centric around going into the international markets as soon as possible. People build company from the start in order to go international with them, not just to satisfy a local need. Um, I would also say that the Nordic consumers are important. I think this is underestimated when it comes to food. So high digital penetration uh, in the Nordics, these are Swedish numbers, but hey, they're, they're valid all over all of the Nordics. Um, sustainability is religion. We, we must realize that. I actually had a session with a huge international company the other week, uh, discussing trends in Sweden and the Nordics. And they say, yeah, well, you know, is sustainability really so important because it makes it hard for us to turn a profit? And I, I'm kind of looking at them and say, what, you mean that you're not sustainable? That's unthinkable to not be sustainable in the Nordics. And if you're trying to go to the Nordics without being sustainable, or do greenwashing, I mean, like, you'd be thrown out uh, faster than you got in. Uh, the, the consumers, however, they reward you with if you come with new stuff because we're really keen on, on trying out new things. And again, I, I just mentioned that we're a small place uh, far up north in the map. It's kind of strange that we're centered in the, in the map here. We should really be in the outskirts somewhere, uh, you know, probably where Alaska is or so, uh, because this is not a core part of the world. Uh, and playing to that advantage, we have said that let's reach out instead. So we have relationships with, last count, we have 105 different entities all across the globe. Some of them, are of course, more key, uh, such as forward fooding. Uh, others could just be a you know small tech hub somewhere in, in Africa or in, in Southeast Asia. But still, they count too. Uh, and our mission is, of course, to make Sweden and Stockholm, a key part of the global ecosystem, not just the Swedish ecosystem. Um, and let me finish off then with, with a picture talking about how you foster these entrepreneurship ecosystems. And this is a page I stole from the book of uh, Babson College um, and a professor called Danny Eisenberg. And you know what you need in order to make an ex ecosystem really truly vibrant. And, uh, and in this case, I think what started here was from the entrepreneur side. Uh, and then come, came cluster leaders such as ourselves that really understood that this is something here. And uh, there's a huge value in building this correctly and putting yourself at the core of this. And by, we, we put ourselves at the core of this future food system, not just because it's so fun to run uh, ecosystems, because it's not it's super hard work and it's not very rewarding. But it gives you an understanding, a network, a sense that then can be expanded into other things. Um, hopefully, we'll see that soon. Then, of course, we had a huge influx as well of cultural leaders, uh, mostly influencers, coming to this sector from the, the perspective of let's not eat meat anymore, let's, let's go vegan instead. And uh, that's a modern approach, and every sweet jumps and everything that's modern. Uh, the investors also came along, corporate execs and public sector leaders have been lagging, I must say. And I think to some extent the corporate execs have been lagging because we don't have so much of a food sector or food industry up north in Sweden um, uh, or north in the Nordics. Uh, and that's mostly because, you know, we haven't been involved so much in building food over the years. We've built sustenance and we survived, um, but probably no one really caught on to herring or fermented shark down uh, on the continent. And uh, therefore we couldn't really, you know, explore and, and export things. We export a tremendous amount of vodka for some reason, but uh, I guess that's a natural competitive advantage of the Nordics. Um, that said, they're waking up now and a couple of these entrepreneurs and newcomers to the ecosystem are really making it big. I mean, it's the Oakley revolution out there. We have a bunch of companies coming 
in the next wave, so to say, after OT. And that has actually caught the eye now of corporate execs, not just in Sweden, but also elsewhere, and also the public sector leaders, because eventually the policy framework will be what guides us to the next gen food system. So it's super important that we have all these uh, coalition of local leaders uh, present and that everybody's model works. And we, I think we're gradually getting there. It's a horrible puzzle to lay, but eventually time, uh, time will help you. Uh, and I think that was basically it. And th these are my contact details. And please reach out if you're interested in the Nordics in, in any way. Uh, we're up here, not just to connect uh, ourselves to Swedish companies, but also to connect international players to the Nordic ecosystem where we sit. Um, thank you so much for <laughs> listening to me. So, well, Johan has been tanked by our team. Who yes, is, uh, then I think uh, I'm up next because I come here. Uh, here is Miranda, so I'll leave it here. Forward footing. So I will just start to uh, share my screen and uh, tell you a bit about Food Valley. My name is Miranda van Dijk and I work as Innovation Analyst at Food Valley NL. And it's my pleasure uh, to be here connected uh, with you via this way. So let's uh, share my screen. I hope you can see it in uh, full presenter mode right now. Um, so as I said, um, I'm happy to tell you a bit more about Foods Valley uh, NL. Um, so what is Foods Valley? I think uh, most of you already know that Foods Valley has its roots in Wageningen. But we are, we are having international ambitions. And that means that uh, the role of Foods Valley is changing and we have been going through a transition as an organization ourselves as well. So I would like to share a bit of that story with you today. Uh, so what is Food Valley? Who are we? What are we? So Food Valley is an international and independent platform for groundbreaking innovations that enable the transition to a sustainable food system. And we live in time of transition. So it's more than ever clear that we have to rethink the way we consume, but also produce our food. And and to achieve that, we have this clear vision that 2050 is the year in which our food system should offer food security for 10 billion people worldwide. And this food should be tasty, affordable, healthy and sustainable with respect for animals and also our planet. And that vision really asked for a switch in the food system. So we have to uh, change systematically. And uh, therefore, we need faster and also more disruptive innovations. And in order to achieve those uh, innovations, uh, we need to work together. So our mission is shaping the future of food together. And this doesn't only mean uh, with companies in the agri-food space, but also unlikely partnerships. For example, across the value chain, but also across sector. So how do we uh, work at Foods Valley? Uh, so as I said, we have this vision for 2050. Uh, and now we are looking, okay, where do we stand today? And where do we want to stand in 2030? So 10 years from now, okay, nine uh, now, but uh, last year we, we've developed a new uh, strategy and uh, we look at what the ecosystem is actually already working on, what their ambitions are, but also what the gap still is, and where can we intervene. And Food Valley is then the independent organization that guides parties throughout this tr transition process and make sure that uh, we uh, collaborate together to get these ambitions, uh, to make these ambitions reality, actually. Um, so Food Valley already exists in 2004 and has been a major uh, driver of sustainable food systems uh, since that time. But as I said, uh, as organization, uh, Food Valley NL has developed over the years. And Food Valley NL used to offer a stage to innovative agri food organizations and also uh, gained international uh, recognition uh, for being a successful innovation network uh, in the first uh, 10 years of existence. But in 2019, we uh, moved more towards ecosystem innovation and are now working 
uh, and acting as a catalyst for uh, the transition. So in order to speed up the process, we now focus even on the longer term with this vision for 2050. And uh, to reach that goals, uh, we, we, have, uh, we have reorganized our organization. So with, uh, also, if you look at the, um, the growth of the organization, last year we grew from, grew from 11 to 26 employees. So also as how we are organized, the organization really changed. Um, if we have a look at the network, uh, of our members. So we have the Food Valley members form the core of our ecosystem and this network is all around the globe. So uh, it's in Europe but also from New Zealand to the US um, our members are spread uh, across the globe and actually um, we are growing very fast. So uh, this slide, the graphic is already outdated because I just checked this morning and currently we have 232 members. So every week new members are joining us and these members cover the entire food value, uh, value chain actually. So from feed, uh, but also seed to uh, shelf, all the whole value chain is covered um, but also uh, all different growth stages are uh, covered. So from very early startups until the corporates, they are all joining us on this um, mission to uh, change the food system to a more sustainable uh, food system. And this slide is not exhaustive, but it gives you an impression of the diversity of organizations we are collaborating with. So the network of uh, Food Valley members forms the core of the ecosystem, uh, but of course many more parties are involved and they are also needed for the transition. So uh, from researchers to investors, retailers, they are all uh, joining us to work collectively on this transition uh, towards a more sustainable food system. Um, so what are we actually doing? So what are the key activities that we are focusing on? So as said, we have now this 10 year, um, 10 year um, we have identified three innovation fields for the, the upcoming 10 years. And these three innovation fields are protein shift, circular agri-food and food and health. And with protein shift, we focus on increasing consumption of plant-based proteins and thereby restoring the protein balance. So in those parts of the world where animal proteins have become the major source of protein, uh, we're now also focusing on increasing the consumption of plant proteins. But this also has another side, of course, and that's preventing also an unsustainable imbalance in countries like India, where, where uh, protein overconsumption does not yet exist. Uh, so that's the focus of the, uh, the innovation field protein shift. The second one is uh, circular agri-food in which we focus on developing uh, groundbreaking innovations in order to uh, develop a food system that optimally uses and reuses uh, natural resources. So really preventing waste and creating a more circular uh, food system. And the third uh, innovation field we are focusing on is uh, food and health in which making the healthy choice, the easy choice, is central. And key activities within this uh, innovation field include personalized nutrition, uh, creating a better purchase and eating environment with, for example, uh, new routes to market, but also um, creating new food options through new food concepts and also positive reformulation. So these are uh, the three innovation fields that have been identified for the upcoming years as most important. But innovation does not happen in a vague room. So we also have identified five uh, innovation support pillars that um, can make sure that this innovation happens and can make sure that it happens more quickly and more effective, effectively. So um, first one is uh, global connections. Uh, in which we scout for opportunities around the world, but also develop close partnerships uh, internationally. Um, I will give a concrete example uh, later, but uh, the second one is also entrepreneurship. So we want to make sure that the front runners that can um, 
can be um, crucial to this uh, transition, have access to a network, capital, but also knowledge. And together with, uh, for example, incubator like Startlab, which is actually our uh, neighbor in the uh, office at the Wageningen campus, uh, but also with the acceleration program uh, Scale Up Food, we prepare these pioneers uh, to be investor ready and to make sure they can create impact um, on the ambition that we share. And the third pillar actually is talent. Because if we have this, all these great ideas, they, we need also the right talent and to attract them maybe from other sectors, but also retain this. So therefore, talent is also one of uh, the pillars we focus on. Uh, the fourth one is uh, shared facilities. Uh, we allow facility sharing um, from uh, research equipment to production facilities. So we have a shared facility finder in which uh, companies, entrepreneurs, but also researchers can easily um, look for the facility that they need to make sure this, uh, this can speed up the innovation in a cost-effective way, actually. And last but not least, we're also focused on, focusing on an ecosystem intelligence uh, platform um, to provide uh, our ecosystem with the latest insights but also provide them with the opportunity to interact. And then this is one of the examples that I would like to highlight on global connections. So Food Valley and the World Economic Forum have formed a partnership and uh, Food Valley and now is the leading European hub uh, in the network of food innovation hubs. And this uh, creates actually a new vehicle to jointly work on the systemic change of the food system and to actually create even more impact together. So that's one of the examples of uh, which only started this year. And um, so I've been talking a lot about the, the change that has been necessary and that's something that cannot change in one single day. So we also have to focus on uh, all the good things that are already happening. Uh, because there are already a lot of good things happening and there are already a great entrepreneurs with a mission, like for example, uh, these three um, Dutch companies that were uh, the winner of the Food Valley Champion uh, Award last year. And uh, for example, in the category of Protein Shift, we have the new milkman focusing on um, plant-based dairy alternatives by creating locally cultivated soy, um, but also uh, in the field of uh, circular agri-foods, uh, we see Innovo, the Dutch biotech company, developing a device with which they can determine the sex of chicken and egg, uh, and this um, can really transform the current uh, production chain. Or in the food of the field of food and health, we see, for example, Grunte, when it's a uh, vegetable uh, ready to eat breakfast and introducing an extra moment uh, in people's dietary pattern to increase the consumption of vegetables. So there are already a lot of great things happening and uh, we are ready to uh, shape the future of food together with all those people who are like-minded uh, and have the same ambition. So I would like to invite you to get all connected. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot hear you to uh, answer any questions, so please feel free to contact me uh, via my email address and to uh, get connected. Thank you very much. Fantastic. So we have thanked also Miranda. I can uh, swear to God that we did that. <laughs> And uh, thanks also uh, to our team for it, making it happen. It's not, we thought it was going to be easier you know, to connect someone over Zoom, to be honest with you. Uh, the reality is that it's not that simple. So, um, well, uh, the reason why we put this together was really to help you to understand you know, how other ecosystems sort of function, right? And provide some food for thoughts and inspirations on what are the kind of recipes and ingredients that actually we need uh, also here to build a truly global ecosystem. Um, now, we're gonna switch uh, on, uh, well, we went from 
the globe or you know the, the idea with the event was to go a little bit you know beyond Barcelona um, to then actually come back over here and uh, we go from ecosystems building all the way into the kitchen um, and we basically ask Edward uh, who is the uh, co-founder and chef at uh, Disfrutar uh, who I don't need to introduce, I guess, to most of you. Uh, how do they actually hack sort of like technology to, to bring it into the kitchen? So without further ado, Edward, the, the stage is yours. And he's going to switch to Spanish. Thank you so much. In primer lugar, decir que es un honor estar aquí. Y estoy súper contento porque estamos en Barcelona, nuestra ciudad, y estamos compartiendo escenario con expertos de ámbitos que a nosotros como cocineros nos interesan mucho. Nosotros somos cocineros creativos, para así decirlo, y siempre pues, para ir un pasito más allá en, en la disciplina nuestra, nos gusta mucho apoyarnos en la industria alimentaria y en expertos de, de otros ¿no? escenarios que al final lo que nos hacen es crecer y aprender. ¿no? Siempre digo que como cocinero toda la vida aprenderemos. He estado aquí sentado, he tomado un montón de notas y es curioso, ¿no? lo primero es ver cómo trabajáis a 10 años vista, 20 años vista, ¿no? analizando el futuro. Nosotros esto es una cosa que no podemos hacer, ¿no? los restaurantes creativos trabajamos el día a día. ¿no? Hoy en día tenemos el tema de Instagram, ¿no? todas las nuevas tecnologías que nos han ayudado muchísimo ¿no? para, para mejorar ¿no? toda la operatividad, la conexión con el cliente, la gestión de la información, pero sí que por otro lado, ¿no? de la misma forma que todas las empresas que he visto aquí, que con algunas de ellas también colaboramos, porque aparte de, de ser cocineros creativos, pues también hacemos asesoramientos ¿no? y sabemos bajar un poquito la tierra del consumidor, pero sí que por ejemplo nosotros en cocina, pues... Es, es común hacer congresos de cocina, compartimos las recetas entre los cocineros, ¿no? Dijéramos, nos pasamos toda la información y esto hace que, queramos o no, la creatividad en alta gastronomía es muy volátil, ¿no? Dijéramos, compartimos recetas, lo compartimos todo y si queremos ser punteros tenemos que destinar muchos recursos para lo que es nuestras cuentas de explotación en I más D si queremos ser punteros, porque nosotros lo que intentamos desde disfrutar, ¿no? desde aquí de Barcelona, igual que todos los que estáis aquí, es ser punteros a nivel mundial en innovación. ¿no? Y después de esta innovación es curioso cómo llegan puntos donde, donde conectan. ¿no? Por ejemplo, siempre lo digo, la, la esferificación, ¿no? una técnica pues, que se ha hecho muy famosa, ¿no? lo de hacer las bolitas líquidas, pues nació gracias a la industria alimentaria que hacía ya muchos años que la aplicaba. ¿no? Y nosotros los cocineros le damos esta vuelta de tuerca ¿no? para hacer al final, la diferencia es la experiencia que tiene el cliente, ¿no? nosotros buscamos la emoción, ¿no? claro que sí que, que estamos comprometidos con los tiempos actuales, estamos comprometidos con, con todos los temas ecológicos y ya por una cuestión de, de, de sociedad, para así decirlo, pero nuestra premisa principal es emocionar, ¿no? emocionar al cliente que también vosotros, en vuestra medida, pues cuando cuando un consumidor va a un supermercado y compra algún producto, pues también buscáis que sea esta emoción, pero nosotros queremos que esta emoción vaya al límite. Y después, en muchos casos, la emoción que nosotros buscamos, al cabo del tiempo, pues puede llegar para todo el mundo, que gracias al trabajo que hacéis vosotros, que es para quitarse el sombrero, pues sois capaces de llegar a millones de personas cuando nosotros, a, a Proud Finance, que diríamos aquí, llegamos a 40 personas por servicio, ¿no? Ahora estamos en Barcelona, el restaurante está a un par de kilómetros y lo que haremos será ver un vídeo para que veáis ¿no? el tipo de restaurante que se disfruta, el tipo de elaboraciones y al final lo que intentamos hacer es que el cliente vea cosas y sienta cosas en, emotivamente pues, que nunca las ha visto. ¿no? Si vemos el vídeo, por favor.
hacer en el restaurante, uh, por suerte, hoy en día la tecnología lo que no puede hacer aún es dar la textura, ¿no? dar el sabor, ¿no? y esto es una cosa pues, que hace que la alimentación pues, sea un mundo único. ¿no? Las personas, tanto cuando van a un restaurante, como cuando van a comerse una hamburguesa, como cuando se compran un gazpacho, ¿no? por mucho que veas la imagen, por mucho que veas un anuncio, la experiencia del comer es algo único. ¿no? Y eso es lo que nos hace especiales y al final... ¿No? Uh, comer es una cosa pues, que todas las personas lo necesitamos ¿no? para vivir vosotros uh, lo tenéis muy interiorizado ¿no? los alimentos tienen que ser nutritivos tienen que ser respetuosos con el medio miráis al futuro para que la alimentación sea sostenible, sea sana y nosotros, estos valores también los tenemos pero los inmediatos teniendo en cuenta que, que nosotros sabemos que las personas acuden a nuestro restaurante durante cuatro horas para tener una experiencia única, nos podemos saltar entre comillas, pues si comen un poquito más de grasa durante un día no pasa nada, ¿no? para que nos intentamos. El hecho es que también la alimentación tiene una parte muy importante que la tecnología nos ayuda mucho a ser mejores, pero hay otra cosa que, que sí que creo que no tenemos que perder de vista, para así decirlo, que son los valores personales. ¿no? A nosotros en el restaurante los clientes vienen y dicen qué bien he comido, qué fantástica que es la comida, pero lo que se sorprende más al cliente es cuando dice aquí todo el mundo sonríe, qué bien me habéis tratado, me he sentido como un rey, me he sentido como en casa. ¿no? Y creo que eso también es, es un reto ¿no? que, tenéis, que tenéis la industria, ¿no? el cómo conectáis con el cliente en casa para transmitir al final este cariño porque el cariño es una cosa que es necesaria es necesaria en, en, en cualquier experiencia gastronómica ya sea de mínimo nivel a máximo nivel ¿no? pero una manzana ¿no? si tú te comes una manzana que has comprado en una tienda donde te la han servido con una sonrisa llegarás a casa y esta manzana pues te la mirarás con más cariño que si la has comido en un supermercado que no te han dado ni las gracias ¿no? Y creo que esto es una cosa, ¿no? que, es, que es un reto, que igual tenéis, que seguro que ya trabajáis mucho, pero ¿no? el conectar las personas con un producto que está en una estantería. ¿no? Aparte del anuncio, dijéramos de transmitir esto. Y nosotros también aprendemos mucho de vosotros, porque por ejemplo en el packaging, ¿no? en el packaging, pues la industria pues, ha hecho un desarrollo bestial, pues nosotros también trabajamos, como no, en los platos, igual que trabajamos en buscar el mejor producto, pero también trabajamos en nuestro packaging, ¿no? en el tema del diseño. Tenemos un equipo de diseñadores que nos diseñan la vajilla exclusiva para nosotros para que también sea especial. Dijéramos, tú vas al restaurante y ves las vajillas pensadas especialmente para cada plato. ¿no? Y al final, la experiencia gastronómica pues es, un, ¿no? es, es todo un círculo ¿no? que va desde, desde cuando el cliente llama por teléfono para hacer la reserva. ¿no? Dijéramos, desde que llamas para hacer la reserva y te estás dos meses pensando tal día iré a cenar allá hasta que el cliente come y se va por la puerta pues es una experiencia que intentamos cuidar de arriba abajo a todos los niveles para intentar pues, ser cada día mejores ¿qué pasa? a día de hoy pues, nos encontramos ante unos retos que por supuesto ya se ha visto aquí ¿no? llevamos un montón de información viendo pues, que, que los hábitos de consumo cambian los hábitos de consumo del consumidor pues, están mutando hacia un futuro más verde y nosotros los cocineros de alta cocina de esto también somos conscientes y también, quieras o no, estamos cambiando ¿no? un poco nuestros hábitos. Nosotros, por suerte, aquí en Barcelona tenemos la suerte de la cocina mediterránea, por así decirlo. ¿no? Nosotros ya históricamente cocinamos con poca grasa y si utilizamos grasa la hacemos con aceite de oliva, grasa vegetal. En nuestra cocina es mucho más importante la verdura y el pescado que la carne. Dijéramos, estamos por sociedad ¿no? y por cultura gastronómica, para así decirlo, pues un pelín mejor posicionados, pero sí que nos falta aún hacer un cambio de chip ¿no? y ver que con un guisante se pueden hacer cosas maravillosas y con una judía pues poder hacer un plato que emocione. ¿vale? Y esto es una cosa que creo que a día de hoy ya se está haciendo muy bien. Hoy, por ejemplo, en el restaurante han venido esta mañana un grupo de 30 alumnos de 10 años. Y cuando hablas con estos alumnos de 10 años, o yo que tengo dos hijas, una de 10 y una de 7, hablo con ellas y aparte de la educación que han recibido en casa, pero ellas ven una judía como algo bueno. No ven a un demonio con patas cuando ven una judía, ¿no? Y cuando ven una hamburguesa, 
pues se la miran normal igual que la judía, ¿no? Y yo creo que esto es una cosa que también todos somos responsables pues, de fomentarlo, ¿no? Y haciendo cosas ricas, dijéramos, los cocineros tenemos que cocinar las judías muy ricas para que todo el mundo las ponga al mismo nivel. Siempre decimos, el caviar es igual de bueno que una sardina, ¿no? El tema es que lo tienes que cocinar bien. Y ahora, sin enrollarme mucho, para que veáis un poquito cómo para nosotros es tan importante la tecnología ¿no? para poder hacer cosas nuevas, nosotros en el restaurante pues, tenemos un equipo de cinco personas que se dedican exclusivamente a IMAG y toda la tecnología que podemos captar nueva pues, la intentamos traer y la utilizamos. Pero ahora nos voy a enseñar tecnología punta, como por ejemplo tenemos la suerte de los amigos de, de Novamid que nos han dejado una impresora 3D y ahora estamos haciendo pruebas, ¿no? pues estamos trabajando con destiladores, ¿no? dijéramos tenemos tecnología más extraña para un restaurante, pero ahora os enseñaré cómo simplemente con una bomba de hacer aire y un sifón, ¿no? que son utensilios que ya pueden ser prehistóricos casi casi, pues gracias a ellos aún podemos hacer técnicas y conceptos nuevos, que al final es lo que hace abrir la cocina y que seamos a punteros, para así decirlo, ¿no? Vamos a ver un primer vídeo. Pero nosotros, uh, la grasa nos gusta mucho porque es lo que nos da sabor, ¿no? Igual que, que vosotros, cuando hacéis algún producto, si no le ponemos algo de grasa o azúcar, pues bueno, le falta, le falta el sabor. Nosotros hacemos una cocina ligera, el menú de gustación es largo y necesitamos no saturar el paladar con grasas. Esta maquinita es una conchadora de chocolate pequeña. ¿Vale? Hay conchadores industriales de chocolate que al final son molinos, son rodillos. En este caso es pequeña, del tamaño de una olla. Nosotros lo que hacemos es poner, un, en este caso es un polvo de alga leofilizada, mantequilla y un poquito de lecitina. Lo conchamos y tenemos como un chocolate, pero con mantequilla de, de algas. Y lo que hacemos es airearlo aplicando el aire con el motor de una pecera, porque de esta forma el aire nos pasa muy lentamente y creamos unas burbujas estables de grasa, que las exponemos en un cuenco, en un vaso, y las congelamos. La grasa cuaja y tenemos una textura de mantequilla súper ligera. ¿vale? Para nosotros lo importante que es pues que gracias a una tontería como es una bomba de pecera, de hacer aire, pues somos capaces de airear grasas puras, que eso nunca lo habíamos hecho. Podemos, dependiendo del molde que utilicemos, pues tenemos formas muy distintas y las podemos hacer, lo bueno ¿no? de las técnicas, para así decirlo, es cuando lo pueden hacer de muchas cosas. ¿no? Nosotros siempre decimos que, que el genio es la persona que hizo un hojaldre, porque gracias a este hojaldre después puede hacer millones de recetas distintas, pues en este caso, gracias a esta técnica de airear mantequillas, podemos airear una mantequilla, pero también podríamos airear un aceite de oliva virgen extra, una grasa de jamón, lo que queramos con grasa, le adicionamos un, un deshidratado del gusto que sea, tanto dulce como salado, y podemos hacer esta técnica. Después también es muy importante cómo se aplican las técnicas. Nosotros siempre lo decimos, que somos cocineros creativos, y queremos hacer cosas que otros cocineros no han hecho para ser creativos, pero la realidad es que los 40 comensales que nos vienen cada día al restaurante, de los 40, pues a lo mejor hay 25 que les importa un pepino, quién es, quién es el primero que lo ha hecho, lo que les importa es que estén buenos. ¿Por qué? Porque es imposible que sepas, ¿no? si no te dedicas profesionalmente, quién ha sido el primero que ha hecho las mantequillas de pues esto no lo sabe nadie ni le interesa. ¿no? pero sí que tiene que ser bueno. Y siempre lo que digo es que nosotros hacemos cocina de vanguardia, pero la vestimos de un traje asequible. Y siempre intentamos poner algo que sea reconocible a nivel gustativo, para que no sea raro. ¿sí? Y jugamos mucho con gustos caseros, porque la gente, cuando es algo muy creativo, lo hemos visto aquí en muchas diapositivas, ¿no? por ejemplo, una leche vegetal, que no es leche, pero para que la gente lo entienda, ¿no? pues ponen not milk ponen mil, no ponen ah, bebida hecha a base de... No, esto no os voy a contar nada porque son los expertos. Pues a nosotros un poquito nos pasa lo mismo. Siempre intentamos, si una técnica o una textura rara, vestirla con algo reconocible para que el cliente así lo capte pues más de entrada. ¿no? Que de eso también hemos aprendido mucho de vosotros. ¿eh? No sé de qué no. 
Y ahora veremos cómo aplicamos esta mantequilla aireada a un plato, ¿no? Y lo que haremos será como una ensalada de gambas. Tenemos gamba roja y el alga codium. El alga, por ejemplo, es un producto que nosotros utilizamos como si fuera una apertura. Digamos, no, no es nada raro ¿no? para nosotros. Y lo que haremos será hacer una salmuera. A 30 gramos de sal por litro de agua, como si fuera agua de mar. Triturvamos este alga codium fresca de Galicia, que tiene un gusto muy pronunciado a mariscos, parece percebe cuando la comes. Y simplemente lo que hacemos es pelar un par de gambas rojas bien frescas. La ponemos en esa samuera durante dos horas y queda la gamba cocinada en un crudo con esa samuera. Y lo que hacemos con esta gamba en samuera, alga codium fresca, las burbujas sólidas que os he enseñado antes cómo hacíamos, Hacemos un consumo de gamba también con las cáscaras, un poco picantito. Y después tenemos aceite de codium, polvo de codium, la esencia de las cabezas. Las cabezas las salteamos y las destrujamos para que tengan todo el gusto. Y eso de aquí es wasabi rallado. Que hoy, hoy en día, por ejemplo, este wasabi, antes teníamos que volvernos locos a ir a Japón a comprar wasabi y ahora en el Monsen se produce wasabi fresco. ¿no? Y lo que hacemos es ponemos las gambas en el plato, un poquito de wasabi, un poco de alga codium en polvo, el alga fresca potenciamos con el, el jugo de las cabezas y encima ponemos esta mantequilla aireada que nos va a dar la grasa a la gamba ¿no? y va a hacer que sea muy 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 gustosa y después ponemos este consomé para que nos limpie el paladar ¿Vale? nosotros, igual que vosotros cuando hacéis un producto ¿no? para, para el consumo final siempre buscamos ¿no? que si hay un elemento que te satura a nivel de dulzor o a nivel de grasa el paladar que haya otro en el plato pues que te lo limpie porque si no al cabo de dos platos ya estarías lleno y nosotros queremos pues, que durante el menú de gustación vayas intercalando cosas frescas ¿no? la utilización de ácidos, de sorbetes, de sopas para que termines el menú con, con ganas dijéramos es importante que la experiencia gastronómica no sea un sufrimiento ¿no? dijéramos tienes que comerte el postre con ganas de comerte el postre y después por último para que veáis dijéramos, tenemos un utensilio que hace más de 25 años que se encuentra en las cocinas que es un sifón de espumas este sifón de espuma se hizo para montar la nata montada en las casas y en el bulli pues, se transformó poniendo gelatinas, ¿no? claras de huevo, en las espumas famosas que se hacen en todo el mundo mundial. Nosotros a veces lo que hacemos es recuperamos utensilios o técnicas que ya se han hecho y trabajamos sobre ellas para intentar hacer cosas que nunca se han hecho, dijéramos. También estaría en a veces recuperar un poquito la historia para intentar a ver si se hace algo nuevo. ¿no? Ahora, por ejemplo, si todo el mundo, si no se hubiera investigado sobre la proteína del guisante, pues nadie se plantearía ahora hacer, hacer productos con proteína de guisante, ¿no? Y vemos pues, que el producto cuando lo trabajas pues, te puede dar resultados, ¿no? Y ahora os voy a enseñar una técnica que, bueno, es muy fácil en cuanto a concepto, pero a veces también lo decimos, ¿no? Las cosas más, más geniales no son tan complicadas. A veces es simplemente abrir los ojos y no tener la vergüenza de hacerlo, de probarlo, y a veces pues, pues salta la chispa, ¿no? esto seguramente que a todos os, os pasa en el trabajo. Y si os parece ahora vamos a ver otro vídeo, y esta es una elaboración que se ha convertido un poquito en un santo y señal de la casa, que se llama un pan chino rellano de caviar. ¿no? Al final lo que es es una masa muy ligera, ¿vale? utilizamos huevo pasteurizada, agua, harina, sal y azúcar y haremos una masa como si fuera una pasta de freír en industria alimentaria hay masas muy ligeras ¿vale? que también aireáis y en este caso pues, lo hacemos a nivel pues, más doméstico casero ¿eh? lo que hacemos es mezclamos harina de trigo con la sal y el azúcar en este caso utilizamos huevo pasteurizado nosotros siempre en el restaurante para elaboraciones frescas para así decirlo, ¿no? utilizamos huevo de corral, pero cuando son fórmulas exactas, ¿no? que ya sabéis vosotros pues que un 1% de grasa más o menos pues te cambia la elaboración, siempre hacemos huevo pasteurizado y así la regularidad es máxima ¿no? de la elaboración. Simplemente lo que hacemos es triturarlo con un turmix y, y tenemos una masa fina y ahora lo que hacemos es ponerlo en un sifón y lo cargamos con el gas. Siempre las... las las espumas las habíamos utilizado tal cual del sifón, o frías o calientes, ¿no? Pero para comer como una salsa o lo que sea. Pero aquí lo que hacemos, la vamos a cocinar esa espuma. 
Ahora estamos preparando un relleno que es un poquito un relleno del ojo, que es caviar y crema agria. ¿vale? Y tenemos un cazo con aceite de oliva, bien caliente, ponemos un cucharón de hierro, aplicamos la espuma, ponemos el relleno que queramos y lo volvemos a cerrar. Y lo sumergimos rápidamente en el aceite. Nunca habíamos frito espumas. Pues el día que hicimos esto, pues se nos abrió otro mundo, ¿no? Que es todo el tema de las masas aireadas fritas, con una textura maravillosa. Esto, este vídeo es en tiempo real, son 20, 22 segundos, 25 de cocción. La masa cuece al instante y al final cuando lo sacamos tenemos una textura maravillosa de brioche, pero lo bueno es que en el interior es fresco. Si nosotros hacemos un brioche, le ponemos un relleno de caviar y lo fermentamos, pues se nos va a cubrir el caviar. ¿no? En este caso, podemos tener la textura del brioche más esponjoso del mundo, pero relleno, no inyectado, sino relleno completamente por un relleno fresco, en este caso es caviar. También le podríamos poner dentro un sorbete de frambuesas, un tartar de atún, lo que queráis. ¿no? Pero esto es una tontería, pero esto nos permite pues, hacer brioche frescos rellenos al momento, ¿no? que es una cosa pues, que nos permite ir un poquito más allá, un juego de texturas y, y un juego de ingredientes pues, que nos abre otro mundo y al final en disfrutar es lo que intentamos hacer cada día. ¿no? Dijéramos, trabajamos más para mañana que para 10 años, ¿no? pero seguramente que técnicas de estas, pues, que ahora mismo las estamos haciendo nosotros, pues igual que en la industria alimentaria, ¿no? cuando uno de vosotros sacáis un producto nuevo al cabo de de 10 años, pues igual hay más gente en el mercado que lo hace, pues en alta cocina pasa lo mismo y seguro que técnicas de estas, pues de aquí 2-3 años, pues estarán en muchos restaurantes y alguna de ellas pues pasarán a, a ser de dominio general. Ha sido un placer enorme estar aquí, muy contento de que se hagan estos actos aquí en Barcelona y gracias pues a, aquí a los jefes que lo han organizado porque, porque tener las ganas, la decisión y el ímpetu y la, y la capacidad pues, de, de traer hasta aquí en esta sala pues, gente tan, tan interesante, ¿no? que, que hay todos los cracks de toda la, la industria que tenemos aquí, pues es, un, es una suerte, es un honor y hace pues, que, que Barcelona tenga músculo, que tenga fuerza y al final las sinergias se hacen sumar y felicidades. Muchísimas gracias, Eduard. La clicker... Eduard creo que te... Muy bien. Uh, muchísimas gracias, uh, Eduard. Uh, it always gives me... Uh, well, it, it blows my mind, really, what, what happens sometimes in the kitchen. We don't realize that uh, I had the chance, actually, to to enjoy a dinner uh, at this return recently and uh, what goes behind it, I think, is pretty mind-blowing. So again, thanks a lot, Edward, for, for sharing this with us. Um, well, uh, I'm gonna wrap up, actually, this session uh, to talk about Mediterranean food tech. As uh, Edward mentioned, you know, the, the region is very well known for its food and uh, I wanted to basically just dip deeper a little bit about into the ecosystem over here. And I'm gonna start um, and hopefully, you know, be able to, to, to embark you on a journey with me of what it is the Mediterranean, Mediterranean food today, what it is uh, or what has, has been seen for a long time, which is actually what's behind my, my back as of now. And I'm going to try to do a little game with you guys um, to help you to imagine also how, you know, this, this, the, the food that we're looking at uh, could look like in the future. So, uh, to me, as an Italian, a Mediterranean food looks like this. So, it's olive oil, it's uh, wine from uh, Spain to France through Italy, and, you know, the, the regions is pretty well known for uh, their, their good wines. Um, it's vegetables and citrus, um, and all the, the different the diversity that we have actually in this ecosystem and is animal proteins, fish and meat primarily, and dairy. Now, um, what I would like you to do with me is effectively to close your eyes for a second and uh, get on a journey with me on how do you think 
this food could look like in, let's say, 10 years from now, not that far. Um, we talked about olive oil, right? So how do you think olive oil you know, could taste like or could smell like? Uh, we talked about animal proteins uh, and fish and meat in particular. So can you imagine how, how will be actually produced maybe in the future? We gave some hints here earlier, but uh, um, again, it's just that uh, it's made by humans as of now, and you can, this can change in the future, right? And if you can see, for instance, robots or, you know, um, actually chemistry, chemistries, you know, building uh, muscle structure, how do they actually interact with machine? So I, I asked myself these questions, and, um, and now you can actually open your eyes. Uh, and I basically couldn't have, I didn't have a very clear view of how, you know, this food could look like in the future. But then I looked into both of our uh, tools to, to get some hints. And uh, I think the future of this industry could actually look more like this. So the Mediterranean food, as we know it, could actually, you know, meat could be grown in labs, for instance, using stem cells. Uh, vegetables could be grown, you know, vertically without the use of soil uh, through vertical farming, through aquaponics, through hydroponics. Um, fields can actually be managed, scanned, and monitored by robots and uh, drones. And I think proteins could also be complemented with other sources. Uh, Carlotte mentioned, you know, air proteins. Here I put insects as a part of, uh, you know, feeding animals, but also could be part of uh, feeding ourselves as human beings. And this is actually more than future; is kind of like present. And this is where this is where I realized that even though I was going to try to get you in the future, this is actually how future or how, how food is produced as we speak. And I think here the opportunity for the Mediterranean area is that uh, we can basically update, so to speak, quote unquote, um, our way of producing food to, to, to take advantage of some of these technologies. But why are we doing all this? And I'm going to go really quickly through some of the challenges. You know, 9.7 billion people to feed by 2050. Um, in the agri-food the agri industry is one of the most important ones. Uh, it's five trillion dollars uh, in value only if we, if we talk about agriculture. 38% um, of the world land is occupied by agriculture and 70% of fresh water is actually used for agriculture. These stats to me were shocking as uh, when I started learning, you know, embarking my, my journey into this, uh, into this space, I basically realized that uh, you know, as much as I'm a positive person and an optimist by nature, maybe, um, you know, the, the challenge is really big. And uh, some of the stats that I have behind me um, basically tells you that the, the situation is quite, uh, you know, urgent and, uh, and we need to act, you know, upon it. Um, but the idea here is, I'm not gonna go through all the numbers because uh, I think you can read it by yourself, but, According to FIO, we actually have 60 harvests to get this right. What this means is that we can iterate with the, the current tools that we have available 60 times to basically revert what is happening. And this to me is, is shocking on the one end, but really gives me the motivation on the other to do something about it. And uh, I think, you know, food, has a, such a, a deep connection with human beings, right? We've seen again some of the, what Mediterranean food, you know, looked like earlier, and uh, there are people behind it. So it's not only, in my view, a human opportunity, but we've also, it's also been proven that it's a financial um, opportunity. And here, I just tried to gather some stats about, you know, the size of the market. As of next year, the food tech uh, market is, is projected to be worth about $250 billion. When I started my journey into this ecosystem in San Francisco back in 2013, I can tell you that it was about probably a tenth of it. 
Uh, and in the, about seven or eight years, uh, it basically it's grown quite significantly to the point where also, you know, large corporates are basically stepping into the game. Carlotta earlier um, presented some of the partnerships. Here I just uh, stated some of the M&A activity that are occurring. But companies also proving that uh, they are on to something interesting and they've built, you know, um, viable businesses, commercially speaking. Uh, Oatly recently IPO'd, Beyond Meat, and, and many others will follow. Uh, and this has basically attracted a lot of investors that uh, over the years, since 2011, this is some data points that we, we gather from our data intelligence platform, uh, have, ra have invested about $19.1 billion into this space. And here I try to basically put uh, four, the four pillars that I believe will be uh, crucial for us to solve basically this issue of effectively reverting and reinventing our food system as this is really what we need to do. And uh, we, if we talk about reinventing proteins, which uh, I'm gonna touch really briefly on, but we're talking about leveraging different technologies such as plant-based, as in uh, developing plant-based alternatives, su such as precision fermentation, which is basically using microorganism to uh, ferment food that replicates what we know as the as the the the, the regular food. Uh, we're also talking about uh, cell agriculture, which uh, will basically entail growing um, using stem cells uh, the same piece of meat or the same piece of uh, of fish by replicating it through the mean of stem cells. When we look at uh, uh, what I call optimizing health sustainably and growing food on every surface. Here is, 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 is what I'm alluding here is vertical farming, is aquaponics, is agroponics, is uh, aeroponics. So different technologies that effectively doesn't entail the use of soil and can actually, within a controlled environment, allow us as human beings to create personalized also food. We can stress plants to develop specific characteristics. And this is basically cannot be done in the, in the field. Um, but I'm also talking about food waste. As I mentioned earlier, one third of the food that we produce in the world gets wasted. And 70% of this gets wasted before even reaching retail, which is shocking. It basically means that we are not producing efficiently, we're overproducing, and then basically needing to, we need to basically even throw that, uh, that food away and figure out how to actually do it. Um, and here I'm talking about, you know, large scales that, for instance, within restaurants using visual imaging technology allows um, chefs to measure the, the food waste that they actually generate and then predict how do they actually can build up their menus to minimize food waste. Or I'm talking about plastic alternatives. So companies are using algae to develop edible, actually, packaging. So instead of throwing it away or in the ocean, we actually eat it. Um, and last but not least, I think uh, building a more efficient, traceable, and transparent food supply chain will be key as consumers effectively are asking to see what, where the food comes from and trace, ideally, through blockchain, for instance, um, the whole, all the steps you know, that the food does before reaching their plate. And Europe is really a hotbed of this innovation uh, ecosystem. I mean, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier that we've mapped about 5,800 companies, about 2,800 of them are actually based in Europe. Um, Europe uh, managed to uh, attract about 20, $22.5 billion uh, worth of investment since 2011 and uh, is also um, the home of 22% of the global food tech unicorns in this world. Um, and last but not least, uh, four out of five agri-food businesses, uh, agri -food the best agri-food universities in the world are actually based in Europe. So I think talent is definitely something that we're not lacking. <laughs> and companies is definitely something we're not lacking. What we're probably lacking is collaborating more across different ecosystems through all, I mean, all the players of the industry to really compete at the global level. And here is where I think uh, Mediterranean has an opportunity because the Mediterranean food tech space counts for about uh, 
one third of that number that I showed you earlier. So if we talk about Southern Europe, including uh, Spain, France, Italy, um, and all the other Mediterranean countries, um, there, we have more than 1,000 companies operating across the supply chain. And here I'm, I'm only speaking about startups and scale-ups. Um, they've raised about 2.6 billion in funding, which is the, the, the data point that in my view, uh, it needs working, as it is one tenth of, uh, of the whole Europe. Um, but uh, the, the good news is that the compounded and annual growth rate is 75% since 2019, which basically means that there's been an acceleration in funding in the last couple of years, despite of the pandemic and everything else. Um, and this again gives me a lot of hope that uh, the Mediterranean region could really become sort of the, the, the scaffolding of a greater you know, European ecosystem that can, go, that can compete at the global level. And uh, here I just basically put some examples of companies that are based actually in Barcelona, which uh, is the reason why uh, we also decided to open our European headquarters in Barcelona. Uh, a company like Cubic Foods, for instance, is, is tackling one of those pillars that I mentioned earlier, in particular reinventing proteins. These guys develop fat analogs using stem cells, so they create animal proteins without the use of them, by, by uh, fermenting uh, microorganism to replicate the exact same composition, chemically speaking, uh, of, animal, of animal fats. Or a company like Novomeat, uh, which 3D prints um, steaks, and and actually the full um, the full piece of uh, of meat um, using 3D printers. And uh, the interesting, I think, bit about it is the fact that uh, they can this allow basically personalization. And here is what we started seeing is that there is a lot of crossovers between different startups. <laughs> to even create hybrid products, which uh, I think is something that is really exciting because uh, some of the challenges of these companies is really building the supply chain. And through collaborating, they can actually accelerate this process quite, quite, uh, quite, quite significantly. Or a company like Eura, which uh, uh, has started, I guess, here in Spain and now uh, works within across 15 countries uh, and exports their products uh, you know, outside of also uh, Spain and they've basically managed to create a whole range of uh, plant-based alternatives that uh, you know, taste like uh, meat analogs. Uh, when it comes to optimizing Hild uh, sustainably, uh, here I picked another company, again, uh, based in this region. Let's talk about Catalonia. <laughs> um, uh, gr uh, um, Groots that actually does vertical farming. Uh, the, the way it works is very simple, effectively, without the use of uh, soil. They, they, they add water and nutrients to feed the plants that you see on this, on this light. Uh, what this allows them to do is to, is to effectively you know, grow food vertically, and this helps a lot with transportation, because this can literally be done across the right, right outside in this corner. And so this you know, is, is just an example of a company that I think you know, locally is doing really well. They hate also retail. Uh, which basically means that consumers are also ready to actually buy these products. Or a company like Elysian, uh, who is actually uh, based in Italy, and uh, they have uh, created a, a sensor that helps to basically predict uh, diseases that plants can actually catch. In particular, there was a big uh, um, problem with a, with a pest called Xylella a couple of years ago in the southern part of Italy. They were basically able to uh, detect in the soil, this microorganism, and therefore predict where it was gonna go next. So this helps massively the farmers to actually understand how they can prevent this type of diseases to occur on their plants. Uh, or a company like Agricolus, again, based in Italy, that uh, is basically digitizing the whole process for farmers, from uh, scanning the field through the use of uh, um, drones, all the way through operating actually robots in the field that helps them to, to run specific tasks, such as killing weeds or um, planting actually seeds. So they're basically digitizing uh, the whole process from seeding all the way through harvesting by helping farmers to actually leverage data to do so. Or another company, again, based in Italy, that uh, uh, it's fighting food waste by creating beer out of an unsold bread. 
Uh, again, the technology here is very easy. E bread uh, comes with yeast. They basically take out the yeast from the unsold bread and they brew it to create actually beer. Uh, there are a number of these companies across the world and uh, the interesting bit about it is that the technology is very simple but the impact can actually be really big. Uh, or a company like uh, um, Next Protein, which is actually using this little, uh, a little guy here, which is, uh, which is called a black soldier fly. Uh, what they actually do is they get all the, the, the byproducts from a, from a farm, namely fruits and vegetables that get thrown away, and they feed these black soldiers with it. What they actually do is they become feeding for animals. And this basically is seeing insect as a technology that effectively takes the surplus food and turns it into a protein, because it's the larvae itself, that then gets fed to the, to the cattle. Or last but not least, my foodie that uh, effectively helps retailers to um, get, well, retailers to get additional food fold by connecting consumers with products that are at the end of their of their expiry date. So they're reaching their expiry date and they can put them on this app so that consumers can pick them up on the way home at a discounted price. Uh, last but not least, the, the final uh, pillar where I think you know, we'll need to work on is really that one of building a more efficient and transparent supply chain. And company like Zoomagri, which we will be able to see upstairs, um, effectively minimizes the time that is needed for uh, food analysis and food safety uh, by nine times by using visual Im imaging technology that effectively allows you through this machine to take millions of pictures of what's in it, a sample of the product, and tells you whether there are, for instance, you know, uh, diseases or uh, unknown objects on, uh, on the thing without basically the need of creating, taking out a sample and, turn it, and going through a lab to basically do it. Or a company like Supplier that is actually in the restaurant space is uh, uh, helping restaurateurs to connect directly with uh, um, producers to basically cut the middlemen, but also to help to trace the products a lot better and therefore allowing the, the restaurateurs to actually do storytelling about the products. So as all this information effectively get diluted through the value chain. And last but not least, connecting food to base in France that uh, effectively helps us as consumers to trace every single step of the supply chain through blockchain. Um, for instance, you know, with organic sliced bread, they are able to trace every single in ingredient provider and therefore telling you uh, exactly where they're localized and what type of uh, products they actually use themselves. So, just to wrap up here again, uh, this is really what the, what the present actually looks like. It's not even talking about the future here. And uh, what gives me a lot of, uh, um, of hope and uh, motivation about building a, a hub here is that uh, we're not going to start from zero. We started in, uh, in London with our first hub back in 2018. And uh, the situation there was there was an ecosystem, but uh, it wasn't as developed, I think, uh, as it is right now in Barcelona. And uh, again, the reason why we started also from here is because 1, 000, there are more than 1,500 companies, tech, tech startups actually working in, that are Barcelona based. Uh, is the third best European cities when it comes to startups. Um, 2021 was the city, has been the city of Barcelona with the set objective to become the world leader in food sustainability. So again, sustainability is very close to most people, I think, here. And uh, most, most of for most, 40% of all Spanish companies are based actually in Catalonia, and at quarter actually in Catalonia. Um, so this one gives us a lot of hope that our European quarter could even actually surpass our uh, UK <laughs> first innovation hub. And uh, what really gives me uh, a, lot of, uh, um, a lot of faith in this is what we were able to achieve in the last six months being effectively in a sort of a, of a pandemic or semi-lockdown here. Um, these are, uh, we, have, we were able to basically onboard nine companies over the last uh, um, past six months. Um, which you see them on the screen. We have received about 47 or so applications from startups, which we vetted and we got down to the shortlist. 
Um, we have uh, created partnership with other 10 partners that are going to help us to grow this ecosystem. And we launched also, um, we, along with EIT Food, uh, a series of interviews featuring uh, women in food tech uh, to really help them to tell their story and get them outside of their sort of Spanish, you know, country, uh, boundaries. And uh, here I think, uh, you know, when we started this journey, we had basically two options. We thought, you know, we could either ignore this ecosystem or we can build it and initiate it. And uh, we've always done it with the view that we were not, we were not gonna be able to do it alone. And uh, that means that effectively we, we set the, food for, the, the foundation for other people to participate in, in this journey with us. And so what I want to share with you here is that uh, we think collaboration is really the only way to make this happen. And we think it is the new competitive advantage of doing business in 2021, really. So without further ado, I wanted to show, to close this with, uh, with a, a Spanglish, I guess, expression, or better yet, <laughs> I think it's very Spanish, but uh, it's one that I like a lot, which is effectively, I think, uh, we need to mojar, mojarnos aquí. En el sentido de, nosotros hemos empezado este viaje uh, como hace seis meses y nos hemos mojado. Lo que vas a pasar es que estamos abiertos y, y muy, uh, y damos la bienvenida a lo que quieren mojarnos con nosotros. Vamos a hacerlo. En seguridad, como este perro que llega a un oblo, pero la verdad es que para construir eh, ecosistemas de, de éxito tenemos que mojarnos. Muchísimas gracias. Y ahora subimos. Uh, now we're gonna we're gonna go on the first floor to actually enjoy uh, the food of 15 companies that we have selected that have prepped this for you. Thank you very much for coming, and thanks to all my team for making actually this happen, including you guys. Cheers.